I'm going to put, put it on a live. Any YouTube right now? You're recording. I'm leaving. I'm always terrified that that one sentence I say really funny in Portuguese will become a meme. Okay, guys, before we before we start up with the actual thing, our our intention here is we're going to go for about an hour. And then we're going to take a short break for everybody to go to the bathroom and then we'll come back and go until four o'clock. We're going to try to stop promptly at four o'clock. Okay, last last workshop we went over by some, but today we're really going to try to stop promptly at four. So we'll take one really short break a little bit after three. Okay, like maybe five minutes, and then we'll jump back in. All right. So, uh, Amor, you want to share your screen? You want to share the, the first page? Okay, this. Okay. So, people, let's start here. Should Did they... you start the simulcast on YouTube already? No, we yes. need a center. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I'm going to try while you were speaking, okay? So <laughs> let's start. <laughs> <laughs> we'll record the beginning again at the end and then edit it and put it at the beginning. Okay, the don't worry video. about that. <laughs> so if people are not here, they can watch part of the presentation. Okay, people, now here for who, do, who don't know us, who are we? We are Seminole English for Professionals, and Seminole is a company specialized in working with professionals. Why? Our why, it, uh, it is inspired on Simon Sinek book, is the, tr the transformation of people's career, of professionals' career. People's lives, really, right? Mm -hmm. Because we... we we are holistic people. Your life is more than just your career, right? You yeah. have to have a life with meaning. If you read Viktor Frankl, uh, Frank, Viktor Frankl's book, The Search for Meaning is, is incredible. Um, I recommend it to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. His story is really inspiring in a way because Frankl was a survivor of the Holocaust. He mm -hmm. was in a concentration camp uh, for many years in Germany. He was German, mm -hmm. but Jewish, and he was in a concentration camp for many years. He lost 95% of his family, all of his close family, but he was a psychiatrist and he used his time in the concentration camps to practice psychiatry. And what he noticed was that the survivors were people that had meaning in their lives, right? So while we do focus on career transition, you know, our services are focused on career transition. We hope to help people with, with kind of a more holistic view of their lives and, and uh, you know, the world that we're in and everything. Okay. One more. And why nativize our English? Because we saw, in, according to our experience, that a lot of mistakes are very common among, among our students, our clients. So that's why we, we worked on this workshop, right? So welcome everybody. If you want to talk something more about it, Cliff, Feel free. I just want to say I'm I'm Cliff Nickerson. We're not going out on YouTube, but I still want to say it. I'm Cliff Nickerson. I studied philosophy at the University of Delaware, um, end of the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s. Um, Dr. Jill Biden, the first lady, went to the same university as me, but I did not know her. Okay, but she did go to the university, right? Um, and I later studied. Uh, 
in the mid nineties, I studied communications management, which was focused on the business side of running radio and television stations. It was the nineties. So we didn't have uh, social media, you know, the internet was young. You know, it was like chats, videos took too much time to download, right? So most of what happened on the internet in the 90s was email and chats, and a lot of people didn't think it would last, right? They thought it was a trend, right? Uh, 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 not a trend, but like a fad. Um, but I did learn to physically edit audio and videotape with a machine that cut it, right? Not a useful skill today because the iPhone does all of that stuff much better. But I learned. Right? Um, I came to Brazil in 2000 and I, I uh, kind of fell into teaching, to tell you the truth. And I've probably told this story to a lot of people. I tried to quit teaching on my first day. I had taught and imagined my first class. And I didn't know anything about teaching. So like the idea of preparing class before you go into class had never occurred to me, right? And I go in my first class, the grammar was third conditional. There was passive voice and present perfect, right? And guess what? I didn't know what third conditional meant. I didn't know what passive voice meant. And I didn't know what present perfect meant. I knew how to do those things but I didn't know what, what the grammar words meant. And I literally tried to quit my first day. End of my day, I went into the boss. I said, thank you for the opportunity, but I think you chose the wrong person. She was prepared already, uh, an experienced Brazilian teacher running her school. She had made this photocopy of a grammar book for teachers. And she grabbed this big photocopy from behind her on the shelf and dramatically threw it onto her desk. I don't know if that was intentional. I think it might've been an accident, but to me, it was like, whoa. Oh, shocking. And she said, study. And then I spent the next two years learning how to be a teacher and learning about my language. And I came to really love grammar um, and learn what I was doing, learn how to do the stuff we need to do in the, in the classroom. Um, and now I've got 23 years of teaching. You know, I've been teaching English in Brazil for 23 years, and I've been teaching at Anglo for around 10 years. I teach foreign literature and U.S. history. Um, okay. Andrea, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Andrea. Is it open? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, people, I'm Andrea. I have a, a very large experience in multinationals. And so I had the idea of opening an English school when I worked with Claudia at a very big multinational. And I saw that people didn't really speak English. And then I, I started with a group of people, of engineers of my company to practice English with them because there were people who studied English for about 10 years and they didn't speak English at all. And my boss was a very, very good leader. And then he allowed me to use two hours every Friday to work with the group. So I worked with people and then suddenly people started asking me for private classes. And that was how seminar started. It's name for the first time was Survival English. Then Cliff came to work with me and uh, because of a lot of reasons, we changed our brand to Seminal. And it was a very good surprise because Seminal grew a lot while survival didn't grow, didn't grow. And then we are here now. <laughs> yeah, but we have to, we have to say that we, we learned so much in the time that, that we were survival still that when we changed, when we made the transition to seminal, we came into it knowing a lot more. And you guys probably know, those of you who know me, know I'm fans of psychology, I'm a fan of psychology. And there's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect that they published in 1999, it's new psychology. That when you don't know, if you're incompetent in an area, you don't understand that you need help. 
And in that time that we were survival still, we learned that we needed help. And we learned that we had a lot to learn, right? So as we've come into seminal, we constantly invest in improving our knowledge. It's one of our, you know, key investment areas. Because you, uh, I think probably in any area, but when we talk about business management skills and soft skills, you have to constantly train. It's, it's not something that comes naturally. It should maybe, but it's not something that comes naturally. So there's a bunch of things like we, we always recommend courses for emotional intelligence. Um, Rodrigo Fagundes has a very cheap course on Hotmart that if you have never studied a course for emotional intelligence, a great place to start is Rodrigo Fagundes because his course is really cheap. I don't think it's 100 AIs. And uh, it's, it's Brazilian Portuguese, right? He's a Brazilian kid, guy. He's a kid to me because I'm old, right? But I learned so much about people and myself that we, I had bought his course before they, he changed it, and then we bought it again. Andrea bought it again when they updated the filming and stuff, right? So I highly recommend that. Of course, Paulo Vieira from Method of Cis, you know, uh, highly recommend. Uh, Pedro Superci, right? Very, very good. Uh, so we always have to, we always have to work not just our, our kind of business side, our STEM side, but also our soft skills side. As Simon Sinek said, we should call them human skills, not soft skills, because they're kind of just as important. So guys, let's do our introductions very quickly. Um, you give us your name. If you want to tell us a little bit about your education, you can, but very quickly. Um, and, oh, oops, I skipped the slide. Do you want to go back to that slide? I skipped this slide. Sorry. One more. <laughs> Uh, that last slide said, keep your focus here. That's a nice way to say, stop looking at your cell phone. <laughs> like, okay. um, so say your name, a little bit about your, your, your professional experience or your educational experience. And if you can think of a ready challenge, tell us about the challenge that you have um, in English. Okay. My challenge in English, I like to think is, maybe this is being a little bit of a head case, but it's like Einstein's challenge in math. There's stuff that, that we can understand, like Andrea and I can understand easily, but then to try to break that down in a way that other people are going to understand easily is, is challenging. When we get to the kind of towards the end, we're gonna talk about one of the phrasal verbs take place. And when we get there, you'll, you'll see what it is. There's a, there's for us, there's a clear way that it functions, but to try to explain that in a way that makes easy sense is quite difficult, right? So my big challenge I would say is to try to convert my knowledge into something that's teachable. Okay. Uh, Michelle, you want to jump in first? Yes, I can. I'm Michele Drasco. I'm from Ponta Grossa, Paraná, but now I'm living in Toledo, Paraná. I'm a uh, food technology, but uh, I have other courses in my abilities and skills. Now I'm a plant manager at the Cargill. I work in an uh, animal nutrition business. In a, in a plant here in Goiânia, in Toledo, sorry. I moved for Toledo three months ago and then it's not easy. Sometimes I confuse it with the plants, but now I'm taking care of the Goiânia plant too at the same moment. In this unit is a multi species and they're not a, only one animal is for beefy, for beefy, for poultry, and for pigs. Uh, I'm married and I have a daughter. Now my husband and my daughter uh, living in Canada. 
for a time. My husband is doing a, a, a course, an extension course in, in Canada. And the, my challenge for English is a flow English. I think my English is terrible, but Cliff disagree with me. I know my, 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 my gaps and my mistakes. And the, I want to have the, a flow English to speak and the, do presentations, uh, explain about process. I use it a lot, my English, for meetings, projects, and uh, some time for explanation about problems. There are a lot of problems in my business. And I want to have a flow English to use it not only in a common way, but for my grow in my area. This is important because I think it's important. You feel, how can I say, not safety. Comfortable. But some, Comfortable. Yes, it's better. Comfortable with your English. And sometimes I'm uncomfortable, not because I can't speak, because I not use the better words. It's not only speak. Did, but did I we ever speak tell you correctly. the narration game, Michelle? Sorry? One of the ways you can work on improving your flow is, yes. is a, the narration game while you're doing anything in your head, if, if you're by yourself, you can do it out loud, which I think has value. But in your head, if you can't speak out loud, you narrate everything that's happening in English. You know, like in, you know, in films sometimes there, if you watch Outlander, there's lots of narration in Outlander. Like she tells how she feels and stuff, right? So yes. you assume that role of the narrator talking about you and talking about what's happening around you and just create a narrative, uh, a kind of a narrative flow. Um, there is a little physiological trick when you're talking to yourself, guys, and I know this is going to sound funny, but try to think about the way you move your tongue when you're really talking. Because if you just imagine it in your head it does have benefit but if you try to think about the way your mouth and tongue would move if you were talking out loud it has a lot more benefit it's like when you're doing when you're doing uh bodybuilding or physical exercise when you concentrate on your technique while you're doing it it's more beneficial to you right but that narration game is a it's a good way to help build uh a kind of rhythm and flow in your speech. Okay. Volunteers, who's who's next? I can be can be me. Go ahead. Okay. okay. My name is Gabriel, Brazil. Uh, I'm from Annapolis, Goiás, but now I'm living in Goiânia. Okay. So, uh, Annapolis stays uh, seven kilometers from here. But I live here for work in at Cargill with Michelle, uh, and I uh, I am an engineer, make, mechanical engineer. But I work as a process engineer at Cargill, uh, and I'm single here. I'm single and I live alone, and I am 20 years old, and I guess that my biggest challenge in in speaking English is uh, speaking in a good flow. Uh, speak and uh, without pause, without uh, missing words, um, and and try to do a better communication uh, with a good vocabulary. Well, did I you think say you're twenty. 20 23 years old. Years old. Ah, 23. Yep. Oh, I misheard. 20 years old. <laughs> oh, my gosh, 20. You're already a competent professional at 20. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even 23, Start. that's really young. 
<laughs> yeah, start early. <laughs> yeah, start really early. Yeah. I guess is it. Okay. Rodrigo, I know you don't, you're not shy. Hi, Cliff. Hi, Andrea. Um, uh, uh, I, I have to present myself. Yes, That's introduce, it? introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Rodrigo. Uh, I'm living in Uberlândia and uh, uh, working at um, uh, LD Cellulose. I'm 52. I have uh, five kids, and uh, um, it's my great. Um, uh, it's it's hard. It's, it's very hard to me uh, stay away from my family, and uh, but it's necessary. So so uh, I don't know. What more can I say? Guys, I'm not looking at my cell phone. I'm taking notes for the next native eyes, okay? <laughs> okay. Like physically, <laughs> uh, I'm physically taking notes for what we're going to deal with, I guess, in November when we, when we do the event again, okay? Okay. Gotta Let's go. Rafael, next one. Yes. Hello, people. I am Rafael. I am 35 years old and I was born in the most beautiful city in Brazil called Campos do Jordão. <laughs> and, and now I am here in Campos do Jordão. Uh, well, I am I'm mechanical engineer. I'm working at Otis Elevator. And my challenge here is improve my English, is improve my way, my way to speak, my way to listening. I, I think that's it. And my dream is to sing hip hop like the, the guys. I think when I was singing and understand hip hop, I was very good in English. <laughs> I normally don't recommend Eminem for English practice because his his songs have so many lyrics. And normally when I recommend music to practice, I recommend songs that have repetition. But, you know, you know Eminem. He's got the chorus and then a yes. gigantic, gigantic section with no repetition, right? Oh, right. But I, on the other hand, his rhythm is super, um, like... You know, we have rappers that the rhythm of the words doesn't fit the way people talk in real life. Eminem doesn't do that. Eminem's rhythm is really the way people talk. He just does it really, really fast. You know, a couple of years ago, he was the fastest in rap. So I don't know if he still holds the, the title, but a couple of years ago, he was the fastest. Yeah, I, um, I, said, I said hip hop because they, uh, they, they speak very, very fast. Do you know the song but, Enemy by, um, do you know the song Enemy by Imagine Dragons? Yes, I know. I'm trying to learn that little rap section in the middle. It's really, really difficult. There's like a little rap break in the middle of the song. And that guy is fast and he uses a bunch of different poetic uh, tools. It's a, it's a challenging bit to, to learn. But if you're interested in hip hop, that's you know, go hip back to hip, go back to Run DMC. It's a little hip easier hop. to understand. <laughs> hip and hop. You can learn the lyrics. Hip hop is a uh, uh, standard for me, but uh, the really I I really like heavy metal, like Pantera, and Trax, Metallica, and Lamb of God. <laughs> Lamb of God. Is that a Christian metal group? A gospel group in the I forgot the but but they play heavy metal. Uh -huh. I forgot of where where they they were. Yeah, I know the band. Uh, is it Dream Dream Theater? What is the name of that? There, there's there's another. Yes, Dream Theater. 
Yeah, I know them. They're also Christian metal, right? We say white metal, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I didn't know Lamb of God. I'll check it out. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Next victim. Claudia. Claudia Anderson. Let's go, Claudia. Hi, people. I'm very grateful for the welcome. Uh, my name is Claudia Isidro. I work at some, some years with Andrea in a inter, uh, multinational company, but I finished my contract last May. And the, now I have a, a little uh, uh, business. And uh, nowadays I am working with recruitment and selection. Um, well, and I am studying psychology. I am administrator. I am specialized in human resource. My area for, I don't know, 20, 29 years. But now I am working in a, in a owner, a own business. Uh, I'm married with C. Hobson, uh, and I have a son, Henrique. His name is Henrique. He lives in Alfenas. Uh, well, in more. Yes, ah, my challenge, my challenge in English, my big challenge is to get fluency, the same of all people here said and the speaking in a better way, pronunciation in a better way, and the, we understand the uh, native people, native person, the same as Cliff, <laughs> very easy, because sometimes I get some minutes to get use uh, accent uh, from the American or from, Australian that we used to work in, in that company. Uh, I think this is the, the most difficult thing for me. Well, thank for the, the welcome. Thank you, Cliff and Andrea and you all. Claudia, at Anglo, now at Colegio Phoenix in Guara. Yes. In three of the native teachers, I'm from Delaware. And there's two other teachers from central Pennsylvania. When we're teaching English, we try to speak like human beings, you know. But a lot of people have said that when me and these two guys from central Pennsylvania just start to chat, no one can understand us. Well, <laughs> but we're from the same accent region in the country, right? And, you know, when you become a teacher, you learn you have to teach towards the international standard. You know, we can't use our our regional accent to teach. We don't, I don't want to send you guys out into the world with a Delaware accent, you know. Uh, but I think that that we see so so many little things that in different regional accents, there's there's these little tiny changes in pronunciation. But something Andrea always says is the good thing about English is it's the same language everywhere in the world. When you look at Portuguese, for example, if you're talking to somebody from Porto Principe, or if you're talking to somebody from Portugal or Brazil, it sounds like a different language. Yes. My brother true. in the hospital in Boston worked with a guy from Porto Principe, and he always says that when we're talking online and he hears me speaking Portuguese with people here, he said it sounds like a different language from what he speaks with his with his coworker from Port Alpinsky, right? Yeah. My brother is a polyglot. He speaks several different languages, okay. right? But his Portuguese training was actually continental Portuguese. In university, he, he learned a little bit of Portuguese from Portugal. Okay, right. right. Very so, good. Patricia? Thank you. Patricia is at the beach. Hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon for all. Um, I'm Patricia and I live in Sorocaba. I am 24 and I'm married to Antonio, uh, who is here with us today. <laughs> I don't have children, just a dog called Porpita. 
the bulldog, the French bulldog. And I need to improve my English for my professional. And I, I work at Suzano and I am a supply manage, manager. And English is very important in my daily life here. And my main challenge is conversation. I understand well, but I don't speak much. Uh, I believe that is my main challenge. Uh, nice to meet you all. Patricia, is Porpeta near you? Can we see? Sorry? Can, can we see Porpeta? Porpeta. But can we see? I want to yes. see the dog. Oh, well, look! <laughs> <laughs> what a little cutie. Yeah, so cutie, so cutie. I love dogs. I really do. I have love six. It. I have six dogs. Yes, amazing. It's amazing. Antonio, let's Please introduce Antonio. yourself. The time is difficult now, now, people. Uh, hello, I'm Antonio Sainz. I'm married with Patricia. I have a French bulldog too. Um, 39 years. I'm a coordinator of logistics. And I'm playing, I work in a plant of aluminum. I, well, people, uh, English is very hard to me, you know, né? I don't speak nothing and a word. So, my difficult speaking yeah, and the of the, the issue and yeah, the beginning of the word i don't understand 50 percent of the creative step <laughs> so for me it's very difficult to speak english at this moment. antonio which company ah and um, cba yeah, okay. CBA and the, the group Votorin team. Yeah, we have several Alcoa students here. I don't yeah, think, I don't think we have anybody from CBA, do we? I don't think we have CBA. But we've got a couple Alcoa people. And years ago, I used to do some consulting work for Alcoa in Bosses Chicaldas. So I really love uh, the aluminum business. I know I, I learned a lot about the aluminum business. Very, yeah, very interesting the, the, business. It's a very interesting uh, process, you know. I I I, I, I transport in the the raw material, bauxite. Bauxite. I don't, yeah. I don't say ho, 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 bauxite. Ho, it's the same in English, but with the bauxite. Bauxite. So have the um, about two million tons a year. That's a lot. Anderson, so, you want to jump in? Hi, everybody. I'm Henderson. I am 21 years old. I'm from Valinhos, but uh, now I live in Lorena uh, because I am a student uh, biochemical engineer. Uh, I'm single and uh, I'm starting uh, one uh, a month ago again. Né? Mês passado, é, yeah, um, ago, you're right. Yes. Yeah, in seminal, uh, my main challenge is speak, converse, conversation, etc. Yes. Uh, who do we have? Mateus, you're new, right? You just you just yes, came in. Mateus. Could you introduce yourself, Mateus? Uh, Hello, I'm Mateus. I'm 26 years old. I'm married. I have two kids. I am a food engineer and I work at Cargo with logistics and I am here uh, to learn a lot, to learn about uh, English. Hi, Michelle. Uh, and that's it. Gustavo? Gustavo is trying to enter with his cell phone because uh, his internet is not good. Yeah. Uh, Lucas? Lucas has no audio, I think. 
Lucas, can you hear us right here in the chat, please? Then, then we have uh, Luis Felipe. Ah, yeah, let's do. Luis Felipe, can you? Hi, uh, I'm Luis Felipe. Uh, I'm from Pato Branco, Paraná, uh, but I live in, in Lorena, Sao Paulo. Uh, I study in University of Sao Paulo. Uh, chemical engineer. I meet a lot of dogs. I have uh, two dogs and uh, one parrot. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to work in a party. The main challenge is uh, I'm still starting to communicate and I have a lot of difficulties in English. Oh. A lot of challenge is what brings you to to seminar. Yeah. <laughs> João, can you hear us? You got audio? João Freitas. João, can you hear us? So, it's your time. Can you can you talk to us, João? Hi guys. Okay. João, are you João, are you related to Alessandra Freitas? No, I don't think so. Ah, uh, okay. No, because we we have a student named Alessandra Freitas who's from here in Lorena. I don't know if she's from Lorena, but she lives here in Lorena. Oh, same last name, but I guess like Smith, right? Everybody has the same last name. Okay, and now Gustavo. You've got Gustavo. Yes, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> I'm here. I'm Our here, people, guys. Gustavo Felipe Marinano. Okay. okay. Gustavo? Yes. Let me just get you a nice place here so I can start my video. There we go. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry, my computer was acting up. I'm actually on my phone right now. Uh, well, my name is Gustavo Wenzel. I'm 21. I live in Guaratinguetá, São Paulo. It's a small city next to Lorena and Aparecida, where the basilica rests. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I like doing lots of things. I like uh, reading. I like writing. I'm actually in law school right now. And I think my biggest uh, difficulties are actually saying words with um, R and a consonant right afterwards. For example, order, further, farther, these kinds of words, yeah. But I can't like um, reduce them like as if I were to say, yeah, but like in a sentence, yeah, like in a sentence, if I were to say, I want to order this. It's kind. It comes out wrong. It's weird. I don't know. No, but how it's, it's easily this. understandable. I think, like in in Portuguese, you've got different pronunciations of R depending on where the person's from. So mm -hmm. my the area that I'm from had a lot of Scottish immigration, and in Scotland, the R sound is really strong. So you see in that area of the, the kind of mid-Atlantic area of the United States, everybody's got this really strong R. The problem is that the R in English is almost never the same sound as in Portuguese when you see it in a word. You know, like the phonetics of R are just different. So I think it creates challenges because I can't say porta. I can't say that word right. I've been in Brazil for 23 years, you know. And that's a simple word that I have to say every day, you know, but I just, the R just doesn't come out right, you know? So I, but I think that the R is a super, uh, is a super uh, difficult challenge for everybody. Um, I, I even remember back in the 1980s, there was a, a, a newspaper editorial writer that was writing a, an editorial about travel in Europe, right? And his, in one of his editorials, he said, the first thing about Europe is everyone says R wrong. 
right? Because in every language, the pronunciation is different, and then the different regions, the pronunciation is different, right? But that's a challenge for me too, Gustavo. In Portuguese, I I know when to say like Enrique. I know when to say that all right, but in a lot of words, uh, it's it's very it's a big challenge. Uh, Felipe. Uh, all right, so nice to meet you all, guys. So my name is Felipe. I'm 24. Uh, I'm from Cachoeira Paulista. It's a very small town from near Lorena, right? And I've been an English teacher for three years, and I've always loved the language. And I've always tried to practice as much as I could. And by the way, I would like to talk about the, the hip hop songs, you know, that Rafael told and the Cliff told too. The song Enemy, I know all of the, the lyrics by heart, you know, because I, I really love to practice with music, especially hip hop songs and Eminem songs, because I know they sing pretty fast and that really motivates me, you know, to, to do that particular sound. So can you do the rap section in the middle of Enemy? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I can, but I'm really shy. But like, like we'll do a we'll do a karaoke night sometime. Soon. <laughs> All right, we'll test that out. And I think one of the the most difficult things for me in English would be the the pronunciation of some particular words. You know, like when you have the the word the, the letter P in the middle of a word that you have to close your mouth pretty fast. You know, when you say like, oh, that strips me out. You know, that the P hard to, to me to do it's hard for me to do and sometimes the m too you know when you do like sometimes sometimes you know this to close your mouth and open it again and also the prepositions you know preposition i think it's a, it's a thing that everybody has a hard time doing right so prepositions and some particular sounds in english really put me in hot waters I, when I, I told you guys about the grammar book that I was, I had to study when I first started teaching, it's a grammar book for teachers. And the beginning of the chapter on prepositions starts with an argument about how to define what a preposition is. So if the, the guys with doctorates in linguistics can't agree on a definition for prepositions, then what about the rest of us? <laughs> you know, it's a, very tricky area. We say a lot, teachers say a lot, you have to train your ear, feel the preposition, right? Because it's really hard to give a, a concrete set of rules. Right. Maranata? So, hello everybody, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm an English teacher uh, and um, I've been in love with English for ever. Because like I love singing, so I know what you're talking about when you say that you like to study with uh, English songs. I'm not really into hip hop, but uh, I love English songs and I like to sing them all the time. So I've been always interested in uh, Portuguese grammar, so uh, I love English as well. And I can say that Portuguese and English are in the same level for me. I love both of them. And um, I'm graduated in human resources. I've worked in, I've worked one month in this area, but uh, in a multinational. But I realized that it's not my real area. So I love teaching, I love English, and I've come back. That's why you have me here right now. And um, uh, I think my challenge is a little bit different from everybody else's, but it's uh, um, the, the biggest challenge for me has been always writing some words. So like sometimes there are a lot of consonants in the words and a lot of words. So sometimes I struggle um with identify so is there one more h or is it r or what is it um so i always try to check a lot of words and uh, make sure that i'm not missing anything and i live in piquete it's near yeah it's near 
Guará, Cachoeira Paulista, uh, uh, it's a small town too, like really small, just like Philippe said. <laughs> and that's it. Marinara, my big spelling challenge in English is I E or E I. I write the word and then I look at it and then I change the E and the I and I go, that's also wrong. And then I change it back and I sing the song. We have a song, I before E, except after C, and when pronounced as A, as in neighbor and way. And then I, okay, now I know how to write the word. But I'll write a word with EI three times, going, no, there, it's wrong. It's just not right. And then I have to sing the song to make sure how to spell. And that's in my native language. So let's go, guys. More? Okay, everybody, Michelle was saying uh, with this difficulty with have, uh, but with this difficulty with have and there is, there are, the basic like easy uh, rule is, you cannot use have if it doesn't have a subject. There's got to be somebody having, or you can't use have. Now, we always say that in Portuguese, it's like haver. Because in Portuguese, I can say, há uma festa na sexta-feira, and I can say, tem uma festa na sexta-feira. Whenever ter in Portuguese is the same as haver, you can't use have in English. Because have does not mean a there. Even though it looks like it, it looks like the same word, right? It's not the same word. So we can use have or tear, but only when we mean certain meanings. And then there's there's uh, some little differences. I, I, I don't want to pick on anybody, but when someone said their age in Portuguese, eu tenho idade eu tenho altura, right? I say eu tenho 51 anos de idade, eu tenho 175 centimeters. But there's an example where in English, that's a B, right? I am 51 years old. I am 175 centimeters tall, right? So there are certain, um, <laughs> I wonder why. Um, there was a message in the chat that was funny, guys. We have a cat called Mimi, and she bites sometimes. Uh, I think she bites more than the dogs. Uh, so certain things, when you're talking about characteristics, try to remember that in English, it's characteristics with B, right? Now, to get into a little bit, a little bit of detail, our basic thing here shows affirmative question and negative, right? I have a lot of friends. Then we have a third person. Does your boss have any free time? And then a past example, I didn't have lunch today, right? We're not gonna go over our basic grammar here. We just wanted to put some examples of the basic grammar too. So our big two halves are possession and obligation. When, when uh, basically, if I'm holding something, if it's mine, I use have. So I can say, I have a cell phone, meaning it's my cell phone, but I can also say, I have my cell phone, meaning it is here, right? And I'm sure some of you who studied with me for a long time have heard this story, but when I first came to Brazil, I worked with a teacher who lived near me and we would, we would go home from work together. If someone drove, we would go with one of the cars or if the weather was good, we would walk. And if the weather was bad, we'd take the bus together. And in the very beginning, I had just come to Brazil. I said, do you have your car? And my friend Flavio, 
is like, of course, he knows this, right? And he said, yes, I, I do, you know? But then the end of the night we leave and I go, where's your car? And he's like, at my house, <laughs> right? Because in Portuguese, we can say, eu estou com meu carro. But in English, you cannot say, I am with my car. I can't say, I am with my cell phone. If I go to a party with Andrea and someone says, oh, who are you here with? I can say, I am with Andrea, acompanhando ela, right? But be with doesn't mean the same thing as hold. So that's a use of have, a native use of have that we have to be careful about, okay? Uh, I'd like, a couple people to pick something up. If you have something near you, anyone who has something near you, pick up. I have a hanger. By the way, this is a hanger. <laughs> okay. It's the name in English is very easy. It hangs stuff, it's a hanger, right? Somebody want to hold something up and say what they have? I have say what you have. I have a pen. Okay. I have a pen here, but I don't know. A big pen <laughs> for oh, that's a white bar. That's a marker. Yeah. Yeah. Gabriel. Marker. When it's a felt tip, it's normally a marker. I have a mouse. Okay. A mouse, very good. Okay. I have a mechanical pencil. I have a mouse too. <laughs> <laughs> I have a rubber. Uh, I have a mouthwash. <laughs> oh, good. That's just as bad as my hanger. Like, why is your mouthwash there? Why is a hanger next to my hanger? I have no I idea. Really know. I like, have a bottle of water, as usual. <laughs> but we can also use have just for general possession. I have a car, meaning it's my car. I can say um, I have three kids, a very common usage right? I have three kids. In my case, I can say kids, guys. This is another native thing. I can say three kids, but I can say three boys because I have literally three sons, right? My two sons, both boys, and, and Andrea's son, a boy. However, if you've got a mix, you can't say I have three sons. If you've got a mix, you have to say I have three kids, like I said at the beginning, okay? Uh, important point English differentiates sex but not gender so in in English the idea of ameza whenever you guys hear gringos talking you notice that we always mess that up right because in our mind the table is not a woman you know the table is a table <laughs> you know so our tendency Americans tendency is to make everything that's inanimate oh right and say omeza because the closest thing to it in English is the masculine, right? Um, and with people, you have to be careful because you have women and men, you have your uncle and your aunt, different words, right? Now we have some words like parents, where parents is pies, right? But the word parents is a generic word that doesn't have sex or gender, right? So if we think my parents can be a man and a woman, my parents can be two men, my parents can be two women, right? The word parent doesn't have gender itself. And then we have some words like cousin, that's the word's the same, primo and prima, right? So the word doesn't have a gender or sex, it just says the relationship. So we have to be careful about that, but it's a common use of have, right? I might say, how many aunts and uncles do you have, right? And when I was a kid, I had 19 aunts and uncles. Today, unfortunately, I have seven aunts and uncles. It's time passed. Right. So our next one is obligation. And this touches what, what um, Michelle was saying a second ago. I put have here. But if you substituted need in all of my examples, the word need works as well. 
So if I say I have to go to work, I can say I need to go to work. My brother has to work on the weekend. My brother needs to work on the weekend. The students had to do a lot of homework. The students needed to do a lot of homework. I have a lot, I have a lot of cousins. I actually don't know how many cousins I have. I, I uh, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't have contact with all of them anymore. There is one cool thing though, guys, if you ever are watching a movie and in the end of the credits, you see Shane Nickerson, Shane Nickerson is my cousin. I don't have a great relationship with him because I haven't spoken to him since we were children, but that Shane Nickerson that works in movie production, I don't remember exactly what job he does, but it's one of the technical jobs. That Shane Nickerson is my cousin. Okay. The famous comedian, there's a famous comedian, Bruce Nickerson, not my relative, right? He's really funny, but he's not my relative. So an important point here that, that Ms. Shelley was talking about is the use of the two. I have to go to work, right? I need to go to work. We can't say I have go to work. I need go to work. You generally have to put a two to link two verbs together, right? I want to go, I want to do, right? So keep, keep that in mind. The general rule is put a two. Clearly we will talk about exceptions today. This one, I've had trouble describing to people. Have for meals, food, and drink. I can tell you guys, now I don't have any coffee possession. I don't have any coffee. But a second ago, I drank some coffee, right? I had a cup of coffee. You use have, like eat or drink, or tomorrow, right? So Andrea said, uh, before we started, Andrea said, did you have your medicine? Normally we say take medicine, but have medicine is also completely acceptable. Okay. Because the idea of Tomar, like Tomar Cafe de Manhã in English is have breakfast. But in English, we say Tomar Almoço, have lunch, Tomar Janta, have dinner. Okay. So when we talk about consuming food or meals, have is the general go-to word. It's more common than either eat or drink, right? I ate a sandwich. Probably the person says I had a sandwich, right? Or um, I had a snack, right? Rather than I ate a snack. We're gonna practice this quickly. I want everybody to tell me very quickly what you had for lunch. Okay. I hope you know. If you don't know one of your lunch words, you can ask because we need to know those words. Okay. One of the things that Andrea and I have complained about a lot over these past years is a lot of times the vocabulary for food in the English book doesn't match our reality. Like what we really have in Brazil is not the same as what they have in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So if you need a word that's something you normally eat or normally drink, ask us and we'll tell you, okay? It's very important when you're talking to the Gringos, right? The, the, like, I think our breakfast in Brazil is probably pretty common because most of us have bread and cheese and coffee, right? So those are probably common around the world, but there's certain things like, I don't know, papaya is very normal for breakfast here. And you're almost never gonna hear an American say, I had a papaya for breakfast. Right. Uh, I'm gonna call you guys in the order you appear on my camera. So I, this order might seem random to you, but I'm calling you in the order that you guys are on my screen, okay? Anderson, could you begin? What did you have for lunch? Uh, I, I... I don't know, I don't think, teacher. What did you have for lunch? Okay, we uh, say okay, we say the meal. Uh, what did you uh, have for lunch? I eat. I had. I, I had. Uh, I had. Uh, one chi chicken, uh, and rice, rice. Yeah. Okay. 
Rafael, what did you have for lunch? I had rice, chicken, and couscous. How can I say couscous in English? Couscous. Couscous? It's uh, North African, right? It's an Arabic food, I think. Right? I, I don't know. My my grand, my grandmother made for me. My yeah, I, I think couscous was originally... My grandmother is from Pernambuco. Yeah. But I, you know, the first time I had couscous was a Brazilian that I knew in university brought it to a, uh, like we have parties in the US called potluck where everybody brings something to eat, right? And the first time I had couscous was a Brazilian guy brought it to a potluck party, right? So I had never had it before, but it's because it's an ethnic food, it's the same word. like. You say, how do you say feijoada? It's it's feijoada, guys, right? Coxinha, how do you say coxinha? It's coxinha, you know? Claudia, um, what did you have for lunch? I, I had chicken, a piece of meat, and the sphere. You had chicken and, and beef? Yes. Two different kinds of meat? Only meat. I don't Are you on a I, special diet? Yes, proteica. Yeah. And the sphere, a, a, a kind of pasta. I don't know, yeah. like coxinha. Yeah. Sphira. It's a, a sphira is pastry. What? Pastry. Pastry. Pastry is like it's got bread and then some filling in it. Okay. Right. It's pastry. All right. All right. Michelle, what'd you have for lunch? I had rice and beef and the apple juice. Apple juice. Good. Apple yes. Juice Gabriel? Uh, I haven't had lunch yet because I woke up late. So I just have a, I had a breakfast. <laughs> I, get, I remember uh, bread and eggs for breakfast. Um, I just have to brag. Gabriel is our student, and he just busted out a present perfect, perfect, <laughs> a very perfect present perfect, guys. So proud. That's our student. Thanks. I haven't had lunch. Oh, yeah, that, that feels good. Excellent <laughs> present perfect. Guys, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to call other people for the next example. Okay. Uh, can you put up the screen one more? And then, of course, we have have for health conditions. Now, let's go back because I want to make a point here on this last one. I mentioned today, guys, that I have a cold. It's important to think I have a cold is the illness. Estou resfriado. If I say I am cold, eu estou sentindo frio. And for Brazilians, this is a critical error. I hear this mistake from fluent speakers all the time. You know, a Brazilian who speaks English fluently, this mistake they still make. I have a cold is because have plus health condition. I am cold is because it's be plus a characteristic. This is the same thinking that gets us in English. I am 51 years old. I am 175 centimeters. Okay. Or even I am uh a lot of times we use way, but I can say I am 83 kilos. Okay. Remember when you're talking to Americans, the moment you see a metric, you say a metric measurement, Americans pretend not to understand. But I have to say, you, uh, you learned the metric system in order to graduate from high school. So they should know, but you say like kilometers, the Americans are like, oh, oh. Dude, it's not that difficult, right? And then like the same guy who runs 5Ks, you know, on the weekend, he runs 5K runs. Then you say, oh, I live about 12 kilometers from Aparecida. He's like, what? <laughs> uh, next slide, please, one more. I'm running behind, guys. Now, this one is also a really tricky one. You know how Americans and, and British people always say gotta? You always hear us gotta. 
right? I got to see that movie. I got a new car. Because the native speaker has this special expression that we can say, have got, instead of, I have possession, or I have to do something, right? And it's like, what does the got mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just the uh, idiomatic expression. Kind of like in Portuguese, I say, embora and muito embora. What does the muito mean in embora? Not much. The words, the expressions mean the same thing, basically, right? So have got and have mean the same thing with that restriction. Have got for possession and have got for necessity, okay? So I've got to be at work by 7.30, native pronunciation. I got to be at work by 7.30, right? She's got a little black dress. She's got a little black dress. You can barely hear the have. It sounds like the native speaker is using get in the sentence. But in fact, we're saying have got or has got, okay? Um, let's, let's use an example with necessity. Pensa de uma coisa que você precisa fazer, okay? Patricia, can you think of something that you have to do? Right? Um, for example, I have to go to Kaisha, right? You guys know Kaisha. I've got a bureaucratic problem at Kaisha, and the only way to fix it is for me to stay there for four hours, right? I need to talk to a person for two minutes, but I have to stay at Kaisha for four hours, right? So I got to go to Kaisha. I've got to go to Kaisha. Okay. Patricia, can you think of something you have to do? Yes, I, I got to have a dog. <laughs> I send this, this phrase in, in my, in your chat now. But it's, I got a dog. I have a dog is, I got a dog. I have, you don't say I, I have to have, I have to have a dog would be like, eu preciso ter um cachorro. É isso que você quer dizer? No, no. Se você tá falando, eu tenho, it's, I got a dog. Ah, okay. Right? I have to, I gotta do, is the necess necessidade de fazer. Okay. Uh, I have, I have got a, to learn English. Right. I gotta learn English. I gotta, I gotta learn English. Okay. Okay. Second. I lost the screen. Rodrigo, can you think of something that you really need to do? I have to, um, I have to go. Um, I have got. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got to go to the bathroom. Two minutes, okay. João, I saw you for a second. Can you talk? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you think of something you need to do, João? Um, I've got to go to the beach. Excellent. I got to go to the beach. Andrea, too. Andrea's got to go to the beach. She's like, let's go to the beach. Let's go to the beach, right? Um, guys, let's take that break, a couple minutes. Just go to the bathroom, get coffee or whatever, and come right back. Maximum of five minutes, and we'll start back up at 3.22. Two minutes. Okay? <laughs> I think people might need a little bit more time. Five minutes, okay? okay. Take five. See you guys in a moment. Okay.
Hi, Rodrigo. <laughs> We are here together. Turn on your microphone. What's up? What's up? What's up? I'm back. <laughs> I told just two minutes I came running. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you today? Are you in Uberlândia? Yes, yes, yeah? I'm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, well, today I I got up very very early, and then I I went to to the market street here. There there's a lot of fruit and uh, good things to, and the, a lot of uh, sweets. I love uh, those de leite, <laughs> and I spent some time there buying fruit and candies. And Candice, no, sweet. Cliff is eating there. <laughs> yeah. So Here we have uh, much of uh, those gelate. Very, very mm, special. I love it. I love it. I think, I, that's love a, it. I think those gelate is a good example of a food I don't translate. We have... So a, it's not uh, the same, you know? You say caramel, it's not uh, the same. Lemon, uh, how they say raspa de limão? Lemon, lemon peel. Peel. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, prove those de leite with lemon peel? No, it sounds it's, delicious. Yes, it's I love those de leite. It's really good. Like almost, the, it's almost chocolate level. I really love it. I like chocolate. I, I might even like those de leite more. I will send to you uh, a little pot of uh, dust the, the, the 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 liquid kind? The, the yes. creamy kind? Oh, little, little pot. I just <laughs> eat that with a spoon sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the complete. After sending you, send you your uh, address, and I will send you, you. Excellent. Okay? All right. Okay, so people, well, you are during this week, you are going to receive an ebook with everything we are talking here. Okay, there are some bonus. Some um, what's the problem, Cliff? You are closer. To your... I'm just, I'm just saying, and more because you said with everything we're talking about, but there's a yeah. bunch of bonus material in the ebook too, guys. Yeah, two okay. hours is just, is a limited amount of time, right? We put I'm a bunch just. Of stuff in the e I'm just organizing the ebook to, to send it to you okay. during this week because I'm going to send it to the agency, then it goes beautiful. <laughs> I don't know how to do very beautiful things in the computer. So people, for who don't know us and for who know us too, I want to show you what we can do for you, okay? So here we work with mentoring, English mentoring, we are, we are organizing everything to do, to improve our mentoring too, because we need to improve our English, but we also need to improve as a company all the time. So this is something I invest a lot. Cliff and I, we invest a lot in knowledge. And then we have team mentoring, exclusive mentoring, that is the, the mentoring that you do only you and Cliff and I. We have... Exclusive training. This is a kind of exclusive training because we have the communication workshop. Now we have nativeize our English workshop. And we also are going to have our job interviews that is going to be next month. And we have a partnership with, uh, with Claudia. And also we have some corporate, in, uh, corporate services that we are doing this for some time, but we were not uh, advertising it. And I want you to know that we also work with translations, our audios for corporate videos and other products and services that you need uh, in English for your company, okay? So if you need it, any of these kind of services, you can call me and can talk to me during the week. And, that, and when the, the need, the, when you have the need in your company, right? So, but let's go 
We say we say audios, but for two Brazilian companies, when they prepared their international sales video, they wanted the American talking to be in the video. So for two of for two clients, I've done like I've appeared. So, so it can be video too if you if you need somebody to you know you want the American guy in a suit acting all he knows what he's talking about, right? <laughs> Uh, this one is something that we hammer so much here in school. It's a point that we that we never stop talking about. It it seems that this this form doesn't exist in a lot of languages, and the thinking behind it is very similar to the idea of every everything that happens in English, someone needs to do. You know. And we say, in Portuguese, I can say chove muito in janeiro. But who is chovendo in that sentence? And it's nobody. So in English, you say it, right? Because English doesn't, that, you know, we, we can't imagine that rains in January, you know, we can't imagine it. It rains in January. And you go, what is the it? The atmosphere, God, I don't know. It's nothing. It's an abstract concept it is just standing there because we need a subject and there is similar thinking you have to imagine that when i'm talking about existence i say be in english not have right so uh i could say in portuguese um tem dois gatos no sol right but in English, I cannot use have for that. As I mentioned a second ago, there's no subject. I have, there must be a subject to use have. I don't have a subject. So what do I, what do I use? And we have to use there and a form of be. Uh, present tense is there is and there are. So I say there are two cats in the sun. Okay. Or on the roof, right? My cats are in the sun. Okay. And here we have two examples in the present and the past in this in this simple form. In the if I'm talking about one thing, my hanger again, guys. I'm not sure why this is here, but there is a hanger on the desk, right? It's one thing. And there are two pieces of dosage lage left, right? There are two pieces of dosage lage left. So with the plural, it's R. The last two. <laughs> Actually, Andrea knows better than to give me all of the dosage lage at once. <laughs> she just cut a piece and cut that into little pieces. So I didn't eat the whole thing. Right. Um, so if, when I'm speaking in the singular, there is. There is a drugstore on the corner, one pharmacia, right? There was a car accident in front of my house. For those of you guys in industry, accident is super important because in general, we say incident if there are no victims and accident when there are victims. So that's a super important word in industry, but you gotta pay attention to your business because Alcoa, for example, they hate the word accident because they say there's always a root cause. So at Alcoa, even if there's a victim, it's an incident, right? Because they don't want to see the word accident written on a, on a report because something caused it. And if we, if we evaluate it enough, if we ask why enough times, you guys know the five why rule, I hope, right? But if we ask why enough times, eventually we're going to find what the root cause was. So pay attention in your company. Maybe accident is used because typically incident is no victims and accident is victims. But pay attention to what your company says because every company has jargon that's important to adhere to, right? Then we look at our plural there. There are several shoe stores on Main Street. Um, in fact, our Main Street in Lorena is referred to as Huo Principal. It has a guy's name. 
but we refer to it as Huo Principal. But in the town that I grew up in, Huo Principal was literally named Main Street. Main Street is the second most common name for streets in the United States, right? And the, the street that's called Main Street in my hometown really is the Main Street. It's the street with the businesses and the offices and the, the doctors and dentists, right? So not uncommon in the US. Uh, and it's true for Lorena too. There's a bunch of shoe stores, right? And then my last one is a little bit uh, American. There weren't any cupcakes at the bakery. I want to point out, padaria and bakery aren't exactly the same thing. However, we don't have padarias in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So you'll see, there's a French word that you see in some businesses that are like uh, padarias. It's like boulangerie or something. There's a French word that businesses that are like padarias put. And then some places say delicatessen. The thing is a delicatessen is normally frius. You know, they might make their own bread, but the sandwiches are normally with frius. They might be hot sandwiches, but it's like grilled cheese, hot, hot ham and cheese, Rubens and things. Uh, and cupcakes, I think everybody knows, those little, those really nice little cakes with the paper on the outside. So there weren't any cupcakes at the bakery, but their B is not just for simple situations because we can talk about existence in some complicated situations, right? Wait. Like I said, Alcoa doesn't like the word accident because there must be a root cause, okay? So you can use complicated conjugations for your B and talk about different, uh, different levels of possibility or necessity. And let's take a look quickly at our, at my examples. I always argue this. I know when I'm, I'm an American and, and we love Starbucks, right? But Lorena has 100,000 people and no Starbucks. In any city of 100,000 people in my country, there would be two Starbucks. There's normally a Starbucks for every 50,000. So uh, yeah, Starbucks is awesome. It's just, it's wonderful, you know? And they have great pastries, they have great cake and, and really good coffee. It's just expensive, but it's good. It's, you know, it's a, it's a great place. So notice that I'm saying like, seria legal se tivesse. And I say, there should be a Starbucks, right? There wouldn't have been any trouble if I hadn't forgotten my wallet, right? Now I'm talking about this great realm of possibilities. In real life, I forgot my wallet and there was trouble, right? So I'm, I'm really conjugating the hell out of the verbs. I got a nice complicated verb, verb conjugation here. There wouldn't have been any trouble if I hadn't forgotten my wallet. I'm going into a third conditional and showing a lot of complicated grammar, even though there be is a simple idea. And our last example here is an example with a question. When I'm using the simple form of there is or there are, the is jumps in the front. So is there a Starbucks in your town, right? When we have another auxiliary verb, that goes in front of there. And in my sentence here, there could be a good reason. And so the could jumps in front of there, not the be. Okay. Could there be a good reason? And I lost the middle of my sentence because of the chat. Could there be a good reason for Chad to avoid going to the meetings? Okay. So don't be afraid when we use the the existential there to get complicated with your B. You can use it to describe possibilities, necessities, desires, wishes, what would have been good. Okay. So we, we can use a whole bunch of really great, you know, more advanced and more complicated verb, verb conjugations with it. I want to point some.
something out though. If you have a problem with there be, try to create a have sentence that has a subject. So if I say about the, the poem of the, if I say there are three drawers in the dresser, but I'm having problems with there be. So I can say the dresser has three drawers. It's just important that if you trade for have, that you figure out a good way to put a subject for it. It's not always possible. Because I say there is a drugstore on the corner. The corner has a drugstore. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, could everybody who I didn't call for an example put up their hand? You guys know how to put up your hand on on Zoom, right? Not my people, okay? Felipe, Marinata, and Gustavo, keep your hands down. <laughs> okay. I know you guys know how to do it. The other <laughs> other guys who haven't done an example, who didn't do an example in the last act exercise, put your hand up. You know, there's a, like a little button. Where is that button I'm working? Reactions. In English, it's reactions. And you can choose raise hand and it puts you towards the beginning of the list. Okay. Joel, you gave me an example for in the last exercise with Hannah with Gata, right? Antonio, I don't think I got a, Antonio didn't get a example. He's not putting his hand up shy, all right? So think of things that exist, all right? Or used to exist or should exist. You know, when I was a kid, there was a, when I was a kid, there was a Vietnamese restaurant on Main Street. I don't know if that restaurant still exists, right? But when I think to my childhood, we ate Vietnamese food because we because there was a Vietnamese restaurant on Main Street. Vietnamese food is really good. Really, really good. So, Michelle, give us an example of existence. There isn't a Starbucks here in Tolib. You stole my example, Michelle. <laughs> it's a terrible example, but it's true. Do you think there should be? No, because Starbucks, it's only one owner. I don't know if you know, and the, this guy choose the, the city, for example, there are, there are three or four Starbucks in Brasilia, but the, they, how can I say, they lost a lot of time to, to decide to, to have a Starbucks in Brasilia. I know because my husband called to Starbucks when we moved to Goiânia, and the, the answer, the answer, uh, how can I say? They had the, uh, uh, a search about the, the units. In that moment, it, it was not uh, interesting have a Starbucks. Yeah, I, I understand why. Because in North America, they built too many Starbucks. And yes. then they, they had to shut down about 200 stores because there were a bunch of, a bunch of towns that just had too many Starbucks and they were competing against each other. And I, I bet you that here in Brazil to have sustainable growth, they're trying not to have two Starbucks in a town like Lorena. In the US that would be sustainable because they can pay in dollars for the drinks, you know? But probably here in Brazil, having a Starbucks in Lorena isn't sustainable. We have so many good cafes in Lorena. Like, complain about the city all you like, but there are great cafes here, you know, where you but, can get good pastry, good cake, and excellent coffee. And you put a Starbucks, it's like, 